Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us and welcome to the T-Space Architecture Lecture Series. This will be the first lecture in a series of eight public lectures organized by T-Space within the framework of the Architecture Residency Program. And I'll just take a few minutes to introduce um, all of us here very quickly while everyone is settling in. Um, the 2023 Architecture Residency is led by Stephen Hall and Irene Socrelia, and my name is Hannah Hill, this year's residency host. And we have Marissa as our co-host today as well, and joining us will be Eric Kiviat and all the residents for the 2023 program. And I just wanted to quickly mention for the new audience uh, briefly that T-Space is a nonprofit organization. It is an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation, and it focuses on arts, education, design, and ecology. T-Space programming supports the coming together of the arts, architecture, art, music, and poetry. In addition to the architecture residency program, T-Space organizes synthesis of the arts, events involving art and architecture, exhibitions, poetry readings, and music performances that take place on the grounds in Rhinebeck, New York, where we're calling from today. T-Space Gallery is open to the public, and we would love to have you all visit the current exhibition by Torquase Dyson before it ends on Sunday, July 9th. You can check out our website for all upcoming events at tspacerhinebeck.org, and some programs will still occur virtually as they have been for the past three years. The lecture you've joined today by Eric Kiviat is part of the Architecture Residency Program, a 25-day intensive that takes place every July. And we have our residents on the panel today as well, as mentioned, they're coming from all parts of the world. We have Isabel, Michael, Rosika, and YP, and Yasmin joining us today. And we're so ha happy to welcome you all to the program this year and to kick off our first lecture of the series. And the, this year's residents are all supported with scholarships that have generously been provided by Elise Jaff and Jeffrey Brown, Steve Pullamood, the J.M. Kaplan Fund, Leica Geosystems, the Al Held Foundation, and the Pratt Family Fund, Archive Fine Art Inc. and its affiliates, Art Creating Inc. and ACLA LLC, Richard Armstrong, Arlene Sheckett, Joan and Martin Cummins, Stan Allen, Margot and Anthony Viscusi, Donna Moylan, and Dr. Ben Chu. We would welcome your support as well to make this programming possible. The residency invites young professionals and students from the fields of art and architecture to experiment with design and focus on critical thinking. The theme of this residency is light and polychromy. And I would just like to say that we are today, of course, in the great company of Eric Kiviat, who is joining us live from his office here in the Hudson Valley. And I will allow Michael Urenke to introduce Eric before we kick off the lecture. Hi, all right. Thank you, Hannah. Um, hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, our guest today, Eric Kiviat. Um, as we kick off the 2023 T-Space Linebeck and Stephen Myron Hall Foundation Architecture Lecture Series. Um, Eric Kiviat is a certified wetland scientist and the executive director and co-founder of Hudsonia, a nonprofit institute for research and education in the environmental sciences. As an avid learner, he has more than 40 years of experience researching and studying wetland ecologies and habitats her pedophonal ecologies, urban and rural biodiversity, and human ecologies. Eric has authored and co-authored 80 publications and 200 technical assistance reports on his research interests, most notably the Northern Chilangunks, um, an ecological survey, and urban biodiversity, the natural history of the New Jersey Meadowlands. Throughout his career, he has taught several courses and workshops and has been involved in committees working extensively with policymakers, planners, and environmentalists. I am very excited to learn more about what you do in your lecture today, Eric, and I'm sure everyone here is as well. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Eric Kiviat. Thank you, Michael. 
Thank you, Michael and Hannah. Let me just ask before I start, how much time do I have, Hannah? Yeah, thanks, Eric. So we'll probably go for approximately 35 to 40 minutes, um, and we'll have a, about a 15 minute Q&A at the end from our panelists and the broader audience. If anyone has questions to post in the chat, uh, we encourage you to do so throughout the course of the lecture um, and at the very end. And feel free to use that Q&A button or the chat function at any time. And you can check out the chat for relevant info. And again, please ask questions throughout the course of the lecture. Happy to address that. Um, and I hope that answers your question, Eric, about how long we have. We're probably going to run for about an hour or so total. Yes, thank you. And I won't be able to monitor the chat, so please do that for me. Yes, absolutely. All right. So I started studying the New Jersey Meadowlands as a case study of urban biodiversity and urban ecology in 1999 when I was asked to join 40 NGOs in commenting on a large mixed use development project that would have filled 200 acres of some of the remaining wetlands on the Hackensack River estuary. And the I found the area so interesting that uh, my colleague, Christy McDonald, and I decided that we would compile the available information on the biology of the area and make it available so the next scientist or planner who came along wouldn't have to start from scratch the way that we did or almost did. So I'm going to tell you about this case study and how it applies, we think, to other urban and industrial areas and what it means for rural areas such as the Mid-Hudson Valley where I live that are uh, in part gradually urbanizing. Now, there we go. Uh, so, the general interesting question, among others, that have, that has come out of our studies in the Meadowlands is, why do some groups of organisms do well in urban areas and industrial areas while other groups don't? And this is something that, you know, even the casual observer who's interested in nature can see in New York City or other large urban or industrial areas. And, you know, right away, if you look at this oblique aerial photograph on the screen, you can see that one of the things that happens very quickly with urbanization usually is that the landscape is fragmented or chopped up into little pieces that are separated by um, highways, in this case, and railroads, uh, garbage landfills, industrial installations, and and so on. And this means that the green spaces that are available for many of the plants and animals and fungi that live in these urban areas are small and they are separated by uh, areas that are probably challenging or impossible for many of these organisms to cross or to live in. Now, Traditionally in the United States, and this is changing now somewhat slowly, uh, urban areas have been regarded as having little biology of interest to researchers or educators or, or bird watchers and, and so on. And these are some of the half-truths, let's call them, about biodiversity in urban areas. And so uh, many biologists have avoided studying urban areas in, in the US and Canada, unlike Europe, where there's a long tradition of urban biodiversity research. And uh, many planners and, and regulators who make decisions about land use and environmental management have not considered that there may be important biology, for example, rare plants or animals in an area that's being developed for 
uh, industry, residents, or even parkland. Uh, many, many of our parklands are uh, somewhat overbuilt in the sense of human impacts on the landscape. So these are some of the things that are important. We could say these are some of the ecosystem services roughly that are provided by uh, urban areas and especially by the green spaces that remain or are created anew in urban areas. And recently, for example, there's been a lot of very interesting research about how even just being able to see green vegetation in an urban area or outside one's home or even a hospital room contributes to one's health and, and well-being and feeling of well-being. Um, there are several things that affect the kinds of organisms, plants, animals, fungi, and, and other organisms that can move into or persist in, in urban and industrial areas. I'm just going to say urban from now on, but I'm also including landscapes that are industrialized or given over to high intensity transportation uses as is true of the Meadowlands and of course, parts of New York City. Uh, the characteristics of each species, the species traits, so to speak, are important because that means that the resources that a species needs and the tolerances that it has to adverse conditions vary from one species to another. There are uh, large scale factors that are not under the control of an individual city or urban landscape. Climate certainly is one of those. And, and barriers like the Hudson River or the New Jersey Turnpike, which affect the movement of plants and animals. The uh, kinds of organisms that are available in the surrounding area, the species pool, and the uh, size or density of those populations, that is the propagule pressure that tends to push individuals out into surrounding areas, has an important influence on what gets into and persists in urban areas. And certainly the character of the landscape and the character of the physics and chemistry and human effects on individual habitats are very important. So urban ecosystems or urban habitats, if you prefer, have these qualities in, in a very general sense. They're highly fragmented, broken up into little pieces. It may be hard for organisms to move from one fragment to another. These patches or fragments are often small, but they often constitute a diversity of different kinds of habitats. So urban areas counterintuitively can have many kinds of habitats that are uh, inhabitable by wild organisms. There are unique land uses that don't occur in rural areas, and there are barriers. And the habitats themselves are uh, often very fertile because cities are sources of plant nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that enrich the environment. Cities and industry also contaminate the environment. They alter soil structure, which is very important for many small animals and of course plants. And there are often what many ecologists call invasive species, that is species that did not in evolve in the area and have become very abundant to the degree where they displace uh, some of the native species. Now, uh, I will say more about invasive species later because this is a much more nuanced issue than, than many people, including many researchers, realize. Um, and the patterns of disturbance, things like floods, fires, uh, severe storms, and so on, are different in cities than they are in the countryside. And those patterns have a big influence on the wild organisms that live there. 
So uh, we think in a very general sense about urban tolerant species and urban sensitive species. And um, we've used the Meadowlands because it's a kind of extreme example of a human altered environment as a way of understanding which organisms are tolerant and can find what they need there and, and which ones are not or are somewhere in between. So the two things that are really key here besides what is available in terms of species outside the urban area are can species cross the urban landscape to get to the habitats often in the green spaces, parks and preserves and vacant lands that haven't been developed or haven't been redeveloped. Um, because during the urbanization process, many organisms disappear. They become extirpated in, in that urban area. And the ones that disappear either are gone for good or they, in some cases, can be replaced by uh, other organisms that can cross this urban landscape. These uh, species are often habitat generalists. They can live in a lot of different kinds of places. They may be able to eat many kinds of foods, build their nests in a variety of structures and, and so on. And they're able to tolerate the poor water quality, uh, often the increased salt levels from de-icing salts on streets or from changes to estuaries that cause sea salt to penetrate farther up uh, an estuary like the Hackensack or the Hudson. Um, and they tolerate many other urban conditions. Urban sensitive species are often those that require large areas of habitat or the ability to move readily from one patch of habitat to another. They, they tend to be poor dispersers. Have, they have difficulty making these movements. They're often habitat specialists. They may be food specialists or specialized in some other way ecologically. And they tend to be sensitive to the physical and chemical conditions in urban areas that are, are often adverse to wild organisms. So, um, can you see the top of my screen with the, I, there, there's a command bar for Zoom that's blocking some of the text at the top. What do you see, Hannah? We can see predictions for Meadowlands okay, at the wonderful. top of your slide. You, yep. you can see everything mm -hmm. then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we expected and, and discovered about the Meadowlands region is that there are a lot of available species in this pool of species in the surrounding less urban parts of Bergen and to some extent Hudson counties in northeastern New Jersey. And we expected to see in the Meadowlands urban areas and, and urban green spaces, species that are tolerant of urban conditions, of course, uh, species associated with those habitats that are abundant, in this case, wetlands and old wetland fill, which is very abundant. And uh, there are biases because people tend to pay more attention to certain groups, particularly birds and fishes, and usually a few kinds of plants in, I'm sorry, uh, the wrong key there. Okay, so this is the uh, what we call the Greater Meadowlands. It let's see, can you see my pointer? Uh, yep, we can see your pointer. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the little white arrow. Mm -hmm. Great. So the, there's this official Meadowlands district. We actually are studying a much larger area because we're interested in things like the former wetlands that are now buried under Newark Airport and the Newark and Elizabeth Container Ports. 
Uh, we're also interested in these less saline areas in the upper end of the Hackensack River estuary, all the way up to uh, off this map, the uh, Oradell Dam, which impounded a large reservoir in the 1920s for much of the water supply of northeastern New Jersey. So we're looking at an area of about 150 square kilometers. Some of the major habitats in this area are wetland fill, uh, landfill cover, very weedy, little or no topsoil, deep and shallow estuarine channels, estuarine or, or tidal marshes, and uh, diked or tide-restricted marshes, which are both very abundant in the meadowlands, partly historically drained hardwood swamps. Uh, there are a few very good examples that remain. And then, of course, the, the built environment and the infrastructure environment, including street trees, which are extremely important for birds and, and many other kinds of organisms. And some of the minor habitats that is, you know, lesser in aerial extent are lawns and cemeteries, sports fields, uh, rocky uplands, um, often historically quarried, small areas of uh, uplands with intermediate moisture, mesic uplands that are still forested, uh, stormwater ponds, ponds that have formed in clay pits from historic brick making activities, and some uh, very limited things like springs and temporary pools and, and streams. So we uh, did a lot of field work looking at eight or 10 different groups of organisms, everything from lichens up to birds and mammals as much as we could. We also did very extensive searching of both the, the scientific and the non-technical natural history literature to find out what other people have documented in the greater meadowlands, both recently and historically. And then we uh, assessed the pool of species available in the not so highly developed parts of Bergen and Hudson counties. Bergen is, is very extensive, goes up to the New York, uh, New York state line actually, um, and has many rural areas. And we wanted to compare that pool of plant and animal species with what we and others had identified in the meadowlands. And we wanted to look at the proportion of that pool in different groups of species that have survived or recolonized the meadowlands. And because we're studying a greater meadowland, so to speak, area that stretches out a uh, little ways beyond some of the very intensive urban development, we could also see some gradients across the landscape from, uh, you know, more urban structure dominated out to more uh, semi-wild vegetation dominated. Now, this is the, uh, these are the numbers of species in different taxonomic groups of organisms, that is evolutionarily related groups of organisms that have been documented in the meadowland, some historically many in the last 20 years or so. And you can see clearly, of course, on the right that the seed plants or flowering plants have lots of species because there are lots of species of plants. This isn't unique to the meadowlands. And then there are some organisms like freshwater mussels uh, which are actually completely absent from the meadowlands and, and everything in between. But the more interesting analysis from my point of view is what percentage or proportion does each of these numbers, whether it's flowering plants or, or lichens or birds or reptiles, uh, represent of the available pool in that group outside the meadowlands in more rural areas. And that's what 
this is what that analysis looks like. And uh, we have only been able to make qualitative comparisons to other urban areas like New York City and uh, places like uh, Austin, Texas, and many, many, many other cities. Uh, but we think that in a general sense, this finding can be extrapolated to other highly human altered areas, whether urbanized and re residents dominated like much of New York City or uh, industry dominated landscapes such as the uh, natural gas hydraulic fracturing fracking landscape in large parts of Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Colorado and some other parts of the United States. So uh, I'm going to show you some details about these different groups of organisms that we've classified roughly as uh, urban tolerant or urban sensitive. Um, and just before we get there, if you if you choose to look at these proportions of the available pools of species uh, in three dimensions with the ability or capacity of the landscape to offer pathways that organisms can cross to move through and, and into the city and the quality of the habitats that they find in those urban green spaces or, or even in street trees. Uh, and then on the vertical axis is the, again, the proportion of the available species. So just, you know, I'm not going to uh, identify all these groups for you. They're basically the same ones that you saw in the two preceding graphs. But if you, uh, I've lost my pointer, here we go. If you integrate this three-dimensional graph into a response surface with the redder and darker colors representing higher proportions of available species, and the greener areas down at the bottom represent representing lower proportions, this gives you an idea. This is conceptual. It's not based on quantitative or experimental data, at least not yet. And I'm hoping that uh, other researchers will take up that question where we've left off. But you can see that there is a, um, a pattern here. And um, even though it's essentially unscaled, we don't have firm numbers to base this on for the most part. So these are some of the uh, these are some of the urban tolerant groups of species. Now, Vines are a heterogeneous group. They're really a guild in ecological terms. In other words, they they have similar lifestyles in that they're they're green, they photosynthesize, but they use other plants and other other kinds of structures for support for the most part. They're uh, one of the most urban tolerant groups and and generally tolerant of uh, challenging ecological conditions and. Uh, birds uh, do well. Certainly, they can uh, cross the landscape. Many birds, especially the larger non passerine birds, which include raptors, water birds, shorebirds, and, and so on, um, because they have powers of strong flight. And even turtles, which are somewhat limited in their abilities to disperse at least in the meadowlands, probably because a large part of the meadowlands is still wetland and uh, waterway, uh, the, there are about half of the available species of turtles and about half of the available, probably 40 or, or 50 species of mosquitoes in northern New Jersey. Now, the passerine birds, which you may think of loosely as the songbirds. They're mostly smaller um, and ornithologists think of them as being more recently evolved. Uh, they they do pretty well, but they don't do quite as well as the non-passerine birds in their uh, 
tolerant in their tolerance for conditions in the meadowlands. Frogs, we see only about a third of the species, and there really are only two of those that are still in the meadowlands. So uh, frogs haven't done well, and they're sensitive to contaminants and to water quality, among other problems that they can experience. And so on down the line, bats, uh, mosses, land snails, dragonflies and damselflies. These are intermediate tolerance groups, but there are quite a few species in these groups that are doing very well in the meadowlands. And that is an important element of meadowlands and other urban biodiversity that we think deserves conservation attention. Now, these are urban sensitive groups, a, a few of them, uh, with a very low proportion of the available species. There are no club mosses at all that we found in, in the greater meadowlands, for example. And in, in that case, it may be because club mosses do well where the soils are a little bit acidic or, or actually very acidic in some cases, but not so well in alkaline or neutral, circumneutral soils. And urban soils tend to be neutral or alkaline because of all the concrete and uh, wallboard debris that's been dumped or broken up into little pieces in, in many urban areas. And some certainly some of the concrete that's been used for paving and sidewalks over the, the centuries. Uh, so these are, are things that we don't see as much in the meadowlands, but even the fishes are pretty diverse. Um, they're not, they don't seem to be very urban tolerant in this region, but there are still lots of kinds because there are lots of different kinds of fishes. Here are just a few examples. The uh, mink is a mustelid mammal related to otters, skunks, weasels, and, and so on. Uh, they can move across the landscape. They do tend to get killed on highways, and they're very sensitive to contamination, especially PCBs. Uh, in the upper image, this is a, a liverwort. Each of those um, lobes, let's call them like this here, are about the size of your one of your fingers. And liverworts are also very sensitive. They need a steady supply of moisture and they seem to require water of good quality. These are some of the uncommon or rare species that do occur in the meadowlands and in some cases actually are doing quite well there, much to the surprise of some of the biologists who study the area. Um, yellow crown night heron is a, a listed species of concern in New Jersey and it uh, supports a couple of small breeding colonies in the Meadowlands, even in a, a very urban park that has some large trees. The Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog is kind of an oddball frog that uh, does well near the coast. It has some tolerance to salinity, which many amphibians don't tolerate, and it, it has several quite substantial populations in the meadowlands. Even so, those populations are under a very high level of threat from uh, installation of AM broadcast antennas, construction of hotels, uh, construction and improvement of roadways and railways, and, and other things that are still changing land use rapidly in the meadowlands and in many other highly urbanized areas and, and some areas that aren't yet highly urbanized. Uh, I will come back to Maddox's clam shrimp, which is a very interesting example of a, a small and, and rather obscure invertebrate that occurs in the meadowlands. Just uh, quickly, we made use of the literature primarily to try to discern what these urban sensitive 
groups of species are sensitive to. And it looks like contaminants, which in the metal ends comprise PCBs, dioxins, heavy metals, arsenic, um, PAH is, you know, it's sort of like a, um, this may not be a good analogy, but a rainbow of contamination from industry over the years, including back in the days when the regulation of industrial pollution was much less effective than it is now. And, and certainly we still have problems with that. So what, what does this add up to? The metal ends, and certainly many other cities, can support important common and rare wild organisms. Uh, underrepresented native habitats need attention. Forest, very important. Freshwater wildland is very important. These are the kinds of green spaces that have really borne the brunt of human activities for a couple of hundred years in northeastern New Jersey. Um, in places where large habitat complexes remain or can be created or reconnected, those are very important for biodiversity. Built areas can be managed to increase their habitat value. More and larger street trees and street trees of a variety of species are one way of doing that. There, there certainly are other ways. Um, there are certain limitations that are hard to get around soil structure that's been altered by uh, cut and fill, construction, dumping is very, very extensive in the meadowlands. That's probably why frogs and salamanders and, and other burrowing animals are not doing as well there. Uh, we are really not able to use well-known organisms like birds to tell us which other kinds of plants and animals are likely to be present. That umbrella species concept doesn't work very well in the meadowlands and probably doesn't work well in a lot of other urban areas because of the fragmentation of habitats and the various ecological stresses that I've mentioned. Um, climate change is affecting the meadowlands. The urban heat island is becoming hotter, so to speak, and wetter, and sea level is rising. And the great majority of the core area of the meadowlands is within a meter or two of uh, high tide level, which means that most of it was flooded by Hurricane Sandy in 2012, when there was a roughly three to four meter storm surge. Fortunately, that brackish water subsided very quickly, so it, it didn't kill everything that uh, is sensitive to, to uh, sea salt. Now, I want to finish up with a few slides illustrating one of the prevalent management practices in the Meadowlands, wetland management practices, and New York City, last I heard and some other East Coast areas and other parts of North America. And uh, this revolves around a concern about a plant called common reed or Phragmites, which you can see, well, I have to find my pointer here. You can see closer view here, the, the uh, flowering or fruiting tops, it's a giant grass. And you can see a massed stand of it in the distance here being sprayed with herbicide by a biological consultant. And you can't see this in this photograph, but the only protective gear he's wearing are gloves. So I'm just going to leave you to your imagination about that. And you can look up uh, the toxicology of glyphosate which is the most commonly used herbicide for Phragmites management and any kind of wild vegetation management, as well as in agriculture. So the, the Phragmites are common reed in the meadowlands in New York City is a non-native subspecies of common reed. There's a native subspecies 
that's very widespread and diverse in North America, but it does not occur as far as we know in the New York City metro region. Uh, there are very, very few occurrences just outside that. And so because it's non-native, and you can probably tell I don't agree with this, uh, you know, kind of monolithic native, non-native concern that a lot of biologists and managers seem to have. Um, because it, it's a non-native subspecies and it has become very dominant in some of these, many of these highly damaged wetlands in the Meadowlands and, and in New York City, uh, there's been a government agency and private sector passion to kill as much Phragmites as possible. And, and I may, that may sound facetious, but it's actually true. There are, there are probably a thousand hectares by now of Phragmites marshes, Phragmites dominated marshes in the Meadowlands that have been managed to some degree or other uh, frequently with, mostly with the goal of reducing greatly reducing the abundance of Phragmites. And there've been many attempts to plant native marsh plants, such as cord grasses in brackish water areas or cattails in fresh areas uh, to replace the Phragmites, which by the way, is almost impossible to do. It actually tends to require some degree of management a year after year or every few years because Phragmites is a, um, highly human tolerant, human activity tolerant weed that's evolved in proximity with human activities for thousands of years. And uh, it's better at it than we are. And, and that actually is so, really something we can learn from. So uh, this uh, type of management, which I call spray, dredge plant, although there's a lot of variations on it, replaces non-native with native plants, at least temporarily, creates mud flats with little vegetation that are used by foraging birds. And there are some spontaneous plants that arrive and develop that are actually quite important foods for in insects and birds. But the problems with the spray dredge plant approach to managing Phragmites marshes, and, and this is just one of the types of habitats that uh, that occurs in the Meadowlands and in other urban areas. It requires perpetual maintenance because the Phragmites comes back. There's a net loss of wetland. Usually these projects are funded by, for example, the Turnpike Authority, which needs to improve an interchange and do away with uh, half an acre or an acre of, of wetland uh, for infrastructure purposes. And it is believed widely in the regulatory agencies, at least officially in public, that if they permit the improvement by killing Phragmites of wetland in one place, that it can replace the values of those pieces of wetlands that are lost somewhere else in, in or near the Meadowlands. Uh, I, I can't go into this, it's very time consuming, but it actually isn't true. There's been quite a lot of research on wetland mitigation, which is what this trade-off or, or compensatory process is called. And it tends to create a few very visible uh, easy to create and manage wetland functions or ecosystem services, but it can't create others uh, except perhaps in a hundred years or much longer. So for example, building organic soils in wetlands takes hundreds or thousands of years. Also very importantly now, uh, Phragmites is very good at sequestering carbon, which you know is important for mitigating climate change. And it is the best wild salinity tolerant plant for building and 
stabilizing tidal marsh soils against sea level rise and increasingly violent storms. So uh, some of my colleagues and collaborators and fellow researchers on Phragmites think that we should be much more uh, selective about how we manage Phragmites and try to keep it, try to keep its non-habitat ecosystem services like protecting marshes from sea level rise, but at the same time manage it so that habitats can be improved for certain kinds of organisms. Because there are some birds and of course plants that don't do well in large dense stands of Phragmites, but might do well if there are smaller patches of Phragmites separated by pools of shallow water or, or other habitats. So there are other kinds of improvements that can be made to habitats by uh, learning from observation and experimentation, preferably on a smaller scale, 100 square meters instead of a you know 20 hectares or 100 hectares um, for some of these sensitive species or species that are rare even though they may be urban tolerant and one of these very interesting organisms is Maddox's clam shrimp we found two kinds of clam shrimps in the meadowlands these animals are about the size of your your little fingernail five to 10 millimeters long. Um, and they live in, sorry, keep losing my pointer. This is the habitat that they live in, long lasting rain pools on dirt roads and off-road vehicle trails. Not the place where most ecologists go to look for a rare and interesting, charismatic, if you will, species like this. Um, now, you might ask, as some very fine biologists have done in the last few years, why should we worry about protecting or conserving something like Maddox's clam shrimp? Well, for most of the ecosystem services that are provided by wild organisms, which is actually the very great majority of all ecosystem services, those services of nature that are essentially free to human society, which we need to survive and to have quality of life. Uh, most of these species are small and uh, hard to see or even microscopic. Uh, fungi, which you probably know from recent media attention are extremely important for providing ecosystem services in forests, but also in marshes and, and around street trees um, and in other kinds of urban habitats. So there's an interesting tension here. One is that there used to be until 2010, uh, on a kilometer of this pipeline service road, sorry, my pointer is not behaving, but which you can see in the lower right image, uh, 40 large long lasting rain pools with a very large population of Maddox's clam shrimp and pools that were being used by a lot of other uh, animals in various ways. Um, most of that complex of habitat was eliminated when the road was rebuilt for a, a wetland mitigation bank in 2010. There are still a few pools and I'm hoping to get back now that it, it's been raining a bit uh, to see if the clam shrimp has survived. Um, but another thing here that's important that, that we really shouldn't lose sight of is that every kind of organism wild organisms in particular, is different chemically and in other ways from the next species. And many of these organisms have given us 
either directly things like pharmaceuticals or industrial adhesives and other kinds of things that have been very useful and very valuable to us economically and, and culturally. Um, and the, those organisms like the liverwort that I showed that are still out there that are just being studied now for their pharmaceutical potential may have a very great deal to offer in the future. It's been said that if you look in the average medicine cabinet, home medicine cabinet, about half of the medicines, uh, whether prescription or over the counter, are either directly from nature or uh, laboratory created analogs of natural substances. Aspirin is a good idea, it's a good example. It is very similar to a, a compound that's found in willow trees and certainly has been extremely important as a, a medication. So here are the, here's the bottom line from my point of view and uh, many ecologists' points of view about management of nature or urban green spaces, for example. Uh, management seeks to optimize ecosystem services. So we want lots of things, whether it's going for a nice walk, forest bathing, as it's called in Japan, or uh, looking out your hospital room, if you're so unlucky to end up in one at uh, green vegetation, which makes people feel better. Policy and management must be flexible. These are three uh, very broad principles that I hope you can remember and, uh, and mull over in the future. Management has to be site specific because every place, whether it's an urban green space or a, a row of street trees or a, uh, a wild thicket, as you can see in this photo, is different from the next one over and should be managed differently so we don't lose what's there that may be of value now or in the future. Uh, management has to be goal directed because different groups of people, stakeholders as they're often called, have uh, different goals. And the goals of one group may conflict. Just trying to get rid of this phone call. Okay, sorry. Um, the goals of one group or one person may conflict with the goals of another. So those goals have to be clarified and decisions have to be made about what's most important. And of course, management needs to be informed by current scientific research. There's often a gap of 10 or 20 or even more years between research, for example, on Phragmites ecology and the approach to managing Phragmites in areas like the Meadowlands. So uh, this book that my New Jersey collaborator and I published a year ago on urban biodiversity using the Meadowlands as a case study is a lot of very detailed natural history and, and background to the Meadowlands, as well as many comments about how we think our findings apply to other cities and other industrial areas. And we're working on a second book that we hope will expand these analyses. Um, many people have helped these studies with funding or information or in other ways. And uh, this is what our organization, Hudsonia, does. And uh, that's where I'm going to stop. And let's see if there are some questions or, or comments. Thank you so much, Eric. That was really terrific. And we appreciate the rich background on your work and the thorough discussion of all of your research findings. 
um, especially as it applies to the Hudson Valley, where the residence site will be for uh, the course of this residency. Um, and when you were mentioning invasive species, I actually, it brought brought to mind the moths that have been everywhere uh -huh. in the area, those spongy moths. We have just been seeing a lot of those around the office and archive lately. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that got me thinking about that. But I really, I want to mention that the um, the project site for the residency this year is located right here in the Hudson Valley, as mentioned, uh, right in the village of Rhinebeck. Uh, near Main Street and next to some small businesses, private residences, and an old school. And the residents will be designing a theoretical house for a poet, but unfortunately they won't get a chance to actually visit the site uh, during their design process and while developing their design concepts. So I did want them to have a sense of the landscape here in case it influences their design process and their decisions uh, when developing their project, which is a house for a poet, a theoretical house for a poet mm -hmm. in Rhinebeck. Um, and I think I'll, I'll open up the questions to everyone else too, but I did just wanna start by asking if you're able to tell us what are some of the ecological concerns to take into account at a site that is considered maybe an in-between zone that's not completely rural and also not completely urban. Okay, well, I don't know firsthand the spot in Rhinebeck that you're talking about, but I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, you know, vegetation is very important. Street trees are very important. Shrubs are very important. One of the most important wildlife habitats in urban areas is shrub thickets. People don't like looking at them, so uh, they're threatened to a large extent. Um, if you're dealing with a very small area, I would say that uh, plant trees where you can, plant uh, flowering forbs that produce simple flowers, not, not uh, compound flowers. So there is pollen and, and nectar for insects to feed on and insects for the predators like spiders to feed on. And, you know, there is a rage now, mostly well-placed, although perhaps a, a bit faddish to use only native plants. I don't think that plantings must be only natives. I think predominantly native plantings is a good idea, but there are some non-natives like purple coneflower, which is actually from the Midwestern United States. It does very well here. It doesn't become invasive as far as anyone knows. And it's one of the best butterfly and, and bee plants that you can put in a garden. So even if it's just a, a window box or, or a small area or a tree pit, uh, there are lots of opportunities. And sometimes these little tiny patches can be connected along uh, a street median, such as you, you see on some of the main thoroughfares in Manhattan. Wow, that's great information. Thank you so much for that. Um, and the residents will be looking at the theme of light and polychromy and with taking color into account um, mm -hmm. on their projects, I think bringing in some of the greenery or thinking about uh, the butterflies, like you mentioned, could be a way for them to explore um, a unique way of incorporating some of the landscape and ecology into their project, if that's a direction that they choose to take. And there's probably nothing more polychromatous, if that's the correct adjective, than flowers and butterflies, and, and many of the bees and wasps and beetles that visit flowers. Yeah. How about the residents? Do any of you have questions to ask Eric? Yeah, I, sorry, I didn't know how to raise my hand on the Zoom. Um, but as you mentioned um, about the urban, the urban tolerant species and the urban sensitive species, depending on their own um, scalar circumstance, I wondered how to think of this without the binary of big and small, but to think of how one could affect another, so how something small could affect something big. Um, and I, and I, I guess thinking of a site I was imagining, or I wanted to ask you for a case or an example of how a small urban intervention could affect greater habitats. Um, 
mm -hmm. uh, how something small could have the potential of of yeah a, a richness that could happen beyond the site um, mm -hmm. right um again it's a hard question to answer without seeing the site that you all are working on or will be working on but you know many insects have great powers of flight and so they are uh especially some of the larger bees and and other and, and many of the butterflies they can move from one garden or window box or uh or or highway median to another to a reasonable extent you can see i saw my first monarch butterfly of the season this morning when i went for my my morning walk and it, by the way it was visiting the flowers of spreading thistle, which is an agricultural pest and an, and an invasive species for, for in, in many people's thinking, but it's a great insect plant. Not something I would put in a garden, but but it, where it grows along the roadside, it's, it's very valuable for pollinators. So uh, you can foster these small organisms like insects and spiders in a very small space and give them something that that will help them move from one small green space or maybe one large green space eventually to another and you know and then there are birds most people enjoy seeing birds whether it's in an urban area or, or rural and by and large most bird food is insects and and spiders to some extent and other small invertebrates especially during the breeding season when birds are feeding their nestlings and, and fledglings. So if you can foster insect diversity and abundance, no, I'm not talking about mosquitoes and spongy moths. We, they don't need our help. And sometimes we, we want to reduce their numbers. But uh, if you can foster insects that are... Uh, interesting enjoyable to look at valuable pollinators and good bird food for example you can do a lot for the bird community in Rhinebeck or New York City and I just add that there's some recent laboratory research suggesting that herbicides may actually be among factors that are at fault in the worldwide decline of insects which uh, ecologists are very concerned about now and and the worldwide decline of birds i might add i have a question from one of the attendees mm -hmm. eric if you don't mind um from sean he is asking what are some of the best first actions that urban or suburban planners can take Integrate some of these principles into their work and share the message with colleagues or constituents, like with education and policy. Good, good points all. Well, you know, we advocate strongly, and partly this is in Hudsonia's self-interest, but it's really much more than that, that an area should be studied before being altered or, or developed. Uh, and and the amount of study obviously can vary depending on the size and, and the nature of the area and where it is and, and what ecologists think might be found there. This applies to uh, a vacant urban lot that's going to be redeveloped. It applies to a brownfield, a contaminated industrial area that's going to be cleaned up. Um, some brownfields support very important plant and animal populations. And in our rush to reindustrialize, uh, we often lose this resource. Not all brownfields are like that, but one can go out and, and distinguish the ones that, that are valuable. And there's, a, there's a, a principle that was developed by Megan Callis, formerly at New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, which is a conservation organization of brownfields to greenfields that is very applicable to the Meadowlands, New York City, Poughkeepsie, perhaps even Rhinebeck. And that is 
if you clean up a damaged area or contaminated area, think about turning it into a park or nature reserve instead of redeveloping it for housing or industry or a warehouse or a, a used car lot. Because green spaces that are available for the ecosystem services that they provide, including recreation for, for people, are enormously valuable if you uh, look at their little by little incremental value over the years into the future. You don't necessarily get a big bang out of preserving a green space in a year or two, as you might get economically from, you know, the, the, uh, the Mirabeau Resort in the village of Rhinebeck, for example, which I'm sure you'll see when you, you wander around the village. Um, which in, intruded into the edge of a fairly good-sized green space. Um, fortunately, the bulk of that green space is left, and we would certainly recommend to folks like yourselves and to, to planners in, in the town of Rhinebeck and the village of Rhinebeck to preserve as much of that as possible. And Hudsonia, 12 or 15 years ago, mapped habitats and analyzed habitats in the entire town of Rhinebeck. And we're now updating that map for the town agencies so they can uh, use it in updating their comprehensive plan, comprehensive land use plan for the town. And you may know that in New York, uh, that comprehensive plan or master plan is a very important tool for a municipality because it's it's not only the way of turning people's values in, into the management and, and protection or development of the landscape, but also of finding and protecting those less common elements of nature that, that uh, need help to survive. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm cu just curious, while you're all on the screen, where are you all from? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Hi Eddie. I have one question. Okay. Yeah. I have seen the film uh, called My Body Wetland. Uh, so will you will you elaborate more about the relationship of body and the wetland you yeah. have shown? Uh, you know, that that's a, a project that my wife did. My my wife is a uh, former dancer, choreographer, massage therapist, uh, movement teacher, and somatics is really her, her province. And that would be a much better question to ask her. Uh, I think what she means by my body, the wetland, is that there's an analogy or a metaphor between the fact that our body is mostly water, mostly fluid, and has fluid moving through it much in the way that the wild landscape has streams and, and wetlands and ponds and groundwater. And uh, Elaine, Elaine Colandrea, my wife, has used that metaphor uh, in many different ways, and, and you can see some of those on her website, uh, and, and it's also on the Watermark Arts website. And that that may uh, answer your questions better than I can. But the way we, we see this is it's really two different ways of looking at nature. I, I'm gonna go so far as to say that, that even science is a metaphor, but I like to think that that the metaphors of science are closer to a common reality that we can all share than many other things are. And that may be, I hope that's not hubris because I'm a scientist, but uh, I, I like to believe that. And it, it certainly has shown itself to be true in uh, the development of uh, medicine and architecture and, and many other disciplines that are based uh, largely or in, in significant part on the sciences. 
I mean, engineering, after all, is applied science, and and architecture is a, a kind of applied science with a substantial measure of other things like aesthetics. Sorry if that's a simplistic explanation. You, you're architects, and and I'm not, but. I do work with architects and landscape architects and engineers quite a lot, as well as planners. And in fact, we it was really excellent to be able to read through the report that um, that you had done, Eric, for the mm. archive and library right here. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, that's being shared with the residents as well. So by the time they Wonderful. are able to come here in person, they could have a sense of the landscape and the ecology that's present mm -hmm. here uh, at the library and archive and, and T2 and the reserve. And um, they'll be able to read through that too, to maybe give them some more context on the area in general. Hopefully that will provide some more information for them as they start to explore <clears throat> their Yeah, you're frozen. Many of them um, are right. calling from different parts of the world today. Mm. And oh, I think I'm dealing with some internet instability. Um, mm. But as we as we were talking today, some of them are calling from uh, from China, from mm. Morocco, uh, India, Beautiful. and uh, other parts of the nation here as well even up here in the Northeast. And then at the end of the program, we're all going to get together uh, right here in the Hudson Valley for a few days of uh, field trips and exploring some of the locations around that are involved in the arts and architecture. So they'll get a good understanding at that time of the context and the environment up here mm -hmm. when they arrive in person at the end of the program. Yeah, wonderful. Sounds like yeah. a great experience. You know, and I'll just mention um, briefly that if you if you read the report we did on the 30 some acre property with the archive and, and Stephen studio. Um, you know, we documented as best we could in, in a fairly short time, the plants and animals of that site, both around the archive and also on the rest of the property. And made some suggestions about how the property could be enhanced for some of the you know less common aspects of biodiversity without interfering of course with the primary use of the property as an archive and studio and and uh, uh, Airbnb and uh, vi visitor site. Um, so one of the, I'll just mention one thing, which is challenging and interesting to me. You probably noticed that outdoors, out, outside the archive, there is a space under the stairwell, uh, which is sloping, I think, to the east or northeast. Um, and it's very dry and there really isn't anything growing in there. And I've created, I didn't have to do this, but it seemed like fun. I created a little challenge for myself to try to figure out how that space can be vegetated with mosses or or some higher plants. And the thing that I'm thinking about right now, and I've got to go out and take a look and, and talk with you folks and, and uh, Demetra and so on uh, about this is if a small amount of water could be redirected from the green roof under the stairwell to moisten that spot so that it, it could be a better substrate for some of the mosses and maybe a few small vascular plants, flowering plants, and maybe even some, some uh, grasses or some things that would have flowers because um, there's a lot of water that comes off the roof. It's feeding that wonderful frog pool, which I, I think is a great innovation, uh, something you could do in other places. My, our, our one suggestion about the, the frog pools, the, the two of them, one, one at uh, uh, the archive and the other at, at the uh, lodging house, um, is to make ramps so it's easier for frogs and other small animals to get in and out of the pool because 
most animals like to move around and, and they may not want to be in the water all the time. So those are some of the, you know, relatively simple, probably inexpensive things uh, that you, you can imagine. And, you know, by all means, look at the report my colleagues and I did. And I think you have my email address. So you can get it from Hannah or Marisa. And uh, you're welcome to send me questions if if you have some more or if you make some interesting observations. I just that sounds, oh, oh go ahead, Isabel. Sorry. I just have one small like technical question. Um, so in thinking about designing uh, through landscape and sort of situating our building and um, like designing through pollinator gardens, are there any um, resources specific to Rhinebeck that we could look up and research, you know, plant types, et cetera? Hmm. About what to plant, for example? Yeah, I don't know about Rhinebeck specifically. There is a, I think it's called a conservation advisory board in Rhinebeck, and you can see it on the town website. And there might be someone on that board who has compiled a list of suitable pollinator plants for the village or the town. Uh, we. We have some very informal lists that are for larger areas of the of the Mid Hudson. And um, if, if you email me to, as a reminder, I'll try to get a list to you. The, the The trick is you you have to find a native plant nursery that's not too far away that is sourcing its stock, it's seed stock or root stock from not too far away so that you're not getting Midwestern plants, for example, like uh, lance-leaved coreopsis, which is often planted for pollinators. We, we don't know what that plant's going to do in 25 or 50 years. It, it might become a, a weed and a problem uh, because it, it hasn't been used here for that long. We know there are some plants like common lilac, Syringa vulgaris, that's been planted here for probably hundreds of years, and it it has not become a pest, has not become invasive. It's not a pollinator plant, but it's a good shade plant, birds build nests in it, um, and it has beautiful floral displays in early in the spring when a lot of other things aren't in flower. Um, but uh, but there are flowering shrubs and and uh, and certainly lots of forbs and grasses and sedges that are that are herb intolerant. And when you think about insects, you want to think not only about the nectar and pollen that many of them need, but also many bees like bumblebees nest in the soil. So it's good to provide us even just a square meter or a couple of square meters of uh, perhaps sandy, friable soil that insects can dig their nest burrows in. Uh, insects need water, so, you know, some kind of water source. And of course, sometimes you, you have to empty that on a weekly basis so mosquitoes don't breed in it. Um, could be a bird bath, could be a, a, a small version of the frog pools at, uh, at the archive. Um, and uh, and some of the pollinators, some of the many of the butterflies and moths, and some other insects that are important flower visitors, um, also need host plants for their larvae to eat. I'll give you an example. You, I'm sure you know the monarch butterfly larva caterpillar eats milkweeds, and it actually does better on certain species of milkweeds than others. So common milkweed and butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed are are three very uh, easy to uh, um, plant and manage uh, plants. And there, you, you can look on the web and find suggestions for creating, I think it's called a monarch butterfly way station, place, a place where butterflies can stop during migration and rest or feed. And maybe in the case of the monarch, lay eggs on a milkweed and start the next generation. 
So uh, it's not just flowers. Flowers are very important. And, and the flowers need to be, you know, if they're planted for pollinators, for, for nectar and pollen consumers, they need to be simple flowers that have stamens that produce pollen. Whereas uh, compound flowers, like you know, a lot of the big fancy roses, uh, the stamens have turned from breeding in, into from selective breeding into extra petals, which looks wonderful, but it means there's no pollen. If you're lucky, there might still be some nectar available for for insects, but uh, pollen obviously is very important. So, like like a lot of things in in managing nature, there there are lots of uh, components to think about. Thank you so much, Eric. You've given us a lot of really great content content to think about and some really inspirational uh, takeaways for the residents as they begin their design process for this project. And I'll be sure to follow up with you um, about those lists, perhaps, and mm -hmm. maybe also reach out to the Conservation Advisory Board so we can get um, some more information from them as it might apply to the specific site. Um, and I hope that all of the attendees to this webinar or the watchers on the YouTube live stream have gotten a lot out of this as well. I know I have, and it's been such a pleasure to have you today, Eric. We really, really appreciate you being Thank here you. and and sharing all of this great expertise and knowledge with us. Um, Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you everyone for joining the webinar. I really appreciate it. And maybe I'll see you when I come out to the archive to to uh, challenge myself about the space under the stairwell. Maybe you'll have some ideas <laughs> about what can be done there. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, you're welcome to come visit anytime, Eric, and I can let you know too when the residents will be here if there's a chance that we could possibly arrange a, a brief meetup at that time as well. Yeah, maybe we can coordinate. Uh, will everyone still be there in the latter part of July, the late July? Because I'm going to be away for part of the month. It will be late July, yes. Uh, okay, the let's, very end of let's July. plan on that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Great. Good to see you all. Take care. Okay. En enjoy the Hudson Valley while you're here. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Hannah.